Well, thank you for coming out this evening. You know what the difference is between a historian and an archaeologist? Archaeologists show slides. And I've learned something else today. I just made this up. An emeritus professor, which I is this fancy title I earned when I retired, means I don't have to wear ties and jackets when I lecture anymore. So I'm very grateful for you being here. Well, uh, the no subject is of greater interest to Christians, to Jews, to even secular people than the question of the historicity of the Exodus and wilderness stories in the Bible. Did the Egyptians really control and dominate the Israelites, the Hebrews? Was there really a Moses? Was there an Exodus? Well, I can't answer all those questions tonight. The lecture I'm giving tonight is part of a three-part package, Israel in Egypt, Israel out of Egypt, and then the third is, where is Mount Sinai and why it doesn't matter? So sadly, I can't give you all three tonight, although I could if you'd stay. I, I'd be willing to. But there are refreshments. Okay. So our focus here really will be on the, the sojourn. Were the Hebrews in Egypt? Now, uh, you can see by my fancy picture of the pyramids that we're going to focus a lot on the Egyptian side of this question and, of course, the biblical side. But just to give you a sense for where the academic world is on these things, perhaps Israel, Israel's most famous archaeologist named Israel Finkelstein, in a very popular book that was translated into many languages uh, called The Bible Unearthed, uh, made this quote in this book. He says, the historical saga contained in the Bible from Abraham's encounter with God and his journey to Canaan to Moses' deliverance of the children of Israel from bondage is a brilliant product of human imagination. A brilliant product of human imagination. Then, too, there is Zahi Hawass. Maybe you don't know him, but any archaeological discovery made in Egypt, he appears on the TV and, and is the expert on everything, when in reality, okay, I will stay out of politics of Egyptology, but Zahi Hawass, uh, with his Indiana Jones hat, um, said this in the New York Times, it's quite some years ago, but it's still relevant and reflects an attitude of many. As archaeologists, we have to say that these stories of Abraham and Joseph and Moses never happened because there is no historical evidence, which I'd like to ask him as a nominal Muslim. It's in the Quran. Are you rejecting the Quran? But I've never asked him that. Now, here's what Wikipedia says, lest you think these are scholars that do not affect the public. Do not affect your average person who might be looking at this, students doing ho homework or writing research papers, which you should never do, by the way. Don't use Wikipedia. Modern archaeology has largely discarded the historicity of the patriarchs and the Exodus story, with it being reframed as constituting the Israelites' inspiring national myth narrative. The Israelites and their culture, according to the modern archaeological account, did not overtake the region of, that is of Canaan by force, but instead branched out of Can the Canaanite peoples and culture through the development of a distinct monotheistic uh, and then later monotheistic religion centered on Yahweh, one of the ancient Canaanite deities. Now, I defy anybody, and my, my good colleague here, Dr. Kurt von Beckham, I know of no god in Canaanite texts or Syrian texts named Yahweh. Am I missing something? But yet there it is. So it's in Wikipedia. It must be right. So you see what we're up against when the academics say things and it trickles down even into the popular media. 
That's why people in church, pastors, need to have an understanding of these things. It's not just something for we academics to kick around. So how should the believer, how should we as believers respond? And I'm sorry, I, I have to sort of turn to see what I put on the screen. Uh, but clearly throughout the Bible, there really is no alternative explanation for who the Israelites are and where they came from. Uh, th there's just no other story. More than 200 times in the Old Testament, the sojourn and exodus is mentioned including in laws. Think of the law that says, hey, don't mistreat the sojourner. You were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You know what it's like to be abused, so don't do that to sojourners in your country. Now, a legal document like that or statement like that has absolutely no meaning if that wasn't true. So those are the kind of things that you find permeating the, um, of course, the songs or uh, the psalm, like Psalm 78, 105, 106, 136, we could add 135 as well. Holy days like uh, Passover, Sukkot, all are connected somehow to the Exodus and wilderness tradition. And then throughout the prophets, again and again, uh, Israel's history is appealed to by people like Hosea and Amos and, and Jeremiah. You name it, it's, it's in the prophets. So it's all over the place. When we come down to the New Testament, uh, I like very much what Paul has to say in 1 Corinthians 10, where he's referring to the exodus and passing through the waters of the sea. He says, now these things happened. Let's pause right there. These things happened. Any theological implications have to come from that reality. If these things didn't happen, as Paul Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, with regard to the resurrection, your faith is in vain. This is the foundation of ancient Israel's religion. Um, this, uh, oops, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I do apologize. We did have to switch my uh, program a little bit, and so we're having some trouble with some interfacing here. But anyway, uh, there's a text here, and I don't see it, so I, I'm so, uh, I'm back up here. This was a book that I uh, organized and edited some years ago, which uh, attacked the question, do historical matters matter to faith? Because some, of course, would say, well, it's what's the theology that comes out of it. You know, liberation theology doesn't need a real historical exodus. It's the idea of liberation, liberation from oppression or whatever it is. And uh, those in... in uh, uh, the neo-Orthodox side of things, well, it's not what's happened, it's, it's the meaning you extract from it, and so on. So this book is, is really dedicated to addressing the question um, of the importance of history by theologians, New Testament scholars, Old Testament scholars, etc. So I'm sure your book, your library has this book. Colin Brown, the systematic theologian, um, said this in his book, History and Faith, if an event such as the Exodus is seen as a paradigm of God's care for his people, the comfort and hope that the believer is extorted, exhorted to have, to draw from uh, it, are surely ill-founded if there is no corresponding historical base. So when Jeremiah says, hey, the same God who brought you out of Egypt is going to bring you out of Babylon. That only has meaning if the people really believe God brought you out of Egypt. Otherwise, what's the hope of being brought out of Babylon? So you see how these things are connected. All right. So, um, uh, yeah, the question then is, what do we do? Uh, how do we address these questions from a historical standpoint? And, of course, archaeology is, an, is it a valuable tool. It doesn't answer every question. But what it does do is provide us with some helpful insights. So the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's a dictum that's uh, of absolute truth. Uh, just because we don't have evidence of something, concrete, objective, tangible evidence, doesn't mean something didn't happen. Uh, in some cases, we don't have an eyewitness to a car running into a motorcycle out here. 
but we might find afterwards glass from the front lights of the car on the street. We know something happened. We don't have maybe an eyewitness, we don't have a video, but we have some evidence. Something suggests something happened. So I'm the first one to admit uh, there is no direct archaeological evidence that I can point to saying, like, Moses slept here. Or this way out of Egypt, Hebrews, follow me. You know, nothing of that sort uh, exists, nor do I think will be found. And I don't expect it to. So there's no direct evidence. But what there is what I would call indirect background evidence. By indirect evidence, I mean where things comparable to what the Bible describes occur. Where names and places that we find in the Bible are found in extra-biblical sources. And thereby, uh, we develop, uh, think of it this way. You have a, a kilo weight on a scale. And I noticed that, that here you like using sugar cubes in your tea or coffee. You put one sugar cube on the weight, doesn't move. You keep adding and adding and adding. At a certain point, the, the scale will tip. And so what I'm talking about is adding a lot of little blocks of sugar onto the scale and see how the weight shifts from not proof, but what I would call a preponderance of evidence. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so indirect evidence, when critically and carefully considered, demonstrates the plausibility of biblical narratives. It doesn't prove it, but it, it shows it's plausible. Uh, so do Bible and archaeology agree on this question? Now, most of you do not know this movie. My wife tells me you should stop using this. The movie Blazing Saddles, you know it. Okay, thank you. One person, two people, three people. This is better than an American audience. Okay, Blazing Saddle is a, is a, a very funny, humorous movie. And the reason it's so funny is it's set in the Old West in 1874 where you have this sheriff, he's trying to be a peacekeeper in a town where there's a lot of uh, disorder and violence. But the story, as you go through the film, there are many what we call anachronisms, things that don't fit in that time period of history. So we see him riding along on his horse here, but when we look closer, if you can read his pouch there, it says Gucci. Now, you really have to look carefully when you're watching us to see Gucci, but Gucci was founded in 1921. So we look at this and we laugh because we know that's not possible. That couldn't have happened, right? And then the scene turns and suddenly the, the sheriff is now uh, has, sees this concert going on by Count Basie's orchestra in the middle of the desert. And Count Basie's orchestra was founded in 1935. So once again, we laugh because we know Count Basie wasn't around at that time in history. And, and on it goes. And by the way, when the story ends, you know, like in, in old Western movies, the good guy run, rides off into a horse into the sunset, he drives in a Cadillac. So one final. Now, these are called anachronisms. They just don't fit. So when I read the book of Exodus, I'm reading with this lens, looking through the archaeological data that I'm aware of, by that I mean archaeological finds, I'm talking about inscriptions, I'm talking about buildings, temples, and so on. When looking through that lens, do I see things in the book of Exodus that make me laugh because it doesn't fit? Most critical scholars will tell you today that the, the book of Exodus, Genesis, these were written in the, the Persian period or the very end of biblical history, the 7th uh, century and into the Persian period. So you would think if the story is being made up at this time, there would be all sorts of things that would reflect that later time, not an earlier time. Let's give you one example. Quite popular is the notion that Exodus was written in the Persian period. And 
I've written about this, and I said, well, wait a minute. Okay, we all know the Persian period. What do you know about the Persians? They're from Iran. The emperor, Darius, Xerxes, is sitting on a throne where? Persepolis. So where's Pharaoh, the bad guy, in the book of Exodus? If the Exodus story is about the Persian period, there's no bad guy Pharaoh in Egypt. It doesn't fit. So really, I get the laugh at what the critics of the Bible are, are putting forward as answers. All right. So let's move on. And I, I, will, I will go as long as I can. And I will cut it off, even if I'm not done, to respect your time, but to also give you ample time. And maybe your questions will lead me to go on to parts that I didn't get to. Okay? Exodus 1, we, we read about the uh, beginnings of the oppression. Something has happened. Uh, fortunes have changed. The good situation that Joseph and his family felt for generations suddenly changes for the worst in Exodus chapter 1. There's a new king which most of us who look at this historically take it to be a new dynasty. A new royal family has come along. And this could be several hundred years after or a hundred years after Joseph's day. We don't know for sure. But uh, the point is things have changed from what they were to what they are. And we find the Israelites pressed into forced labor to make bricks for Pharaoh um, okay, sorry. Uh, bricks for Pharaoh with mortar and bricks and also every kind of field labor. Okay, so the question is, does this picture, as described in Exodus 1, especially in Exodus 5, comport with what we knew about, and I'm picking the new kingdom, Again, for those non-historians, the New Kingdom is around 1,500 to about 1,100. Almost everybody who believes in historical Exodus will place it somewhere in there, okay? So this is not picking one date or another. This is the general period, the New Kingdom, or the late Bronze Age in, in Canaan. So do we have any evidence for this sort of thing going on in Egypt during this time? Um, so... Brick making, building, et cetera, and agriculture. Now, when I go to Egypt, as I will in January, with two different groups, I, one of the places I always take them is to this tomb. This is the entrance to the tomb uh, of a vizier or prime minister named Rechmire. Uh, that's not him, in case you were wondering. That's, that's not him standing in the doorway. That's the guard, but um, yeah. In his tomb, here is, here is the prime minister, Rech Mire, and I, I want to point two things out. Number one, notice he's wearing this white gown, beautiful white linen. The Egyptians are notorious for their beautiful white linen, okay? Just as they are today for cotton. Egyptian cotton is most precious in the world, most costly. Secondly, he's wearing this gown that goes up to his armpits. And this is the kind of gown a prime minister would wear. So if you're trying to think about Joseph and you're reading back into the book of Genesis, if, if indeed he was the prime minister, as I think he was, he would have, Joseph would have been dressed like this, one of these white, beautiful, lovely gowns. But in this tomb, um, Rech Mireille shows all kinds of work going on to build a temple, to, uh, for the king he serves, Thutmose III. And everybody, I think, who has studied some Old Testament will be familiar with the scenes showing bricks being made. And in this case, the, the workers are clearly non-Egyptian. These are foreigners. Uh, so you can see here they're taking water out of a pool, making bricks, mixing mud. Uh, there, here's a, a basket, a bucket-like basket, where mud is being taken and, and uh, to the brick maker. The scene continues, and you can see here um, a very clearly African-looking man, uh, a blonde-haired supervisor, uh, taskmaster. Egyptians aren't blonde, by the way. 
But some of the prisoners that they brought back from North Syria are blonde, just like the prisoners of war they brought from Sudan are black. And so you can see in these scenes uh, people of different ethnic makeups from different countries who are taken as prisoners of the king's campaigns and are brought back. And what are they doing? They're making bricks. They're engaged in building projects. Uh, look at this poor guy bending over with a yoke, lifting it up. And I'm reminded of Leviticus 26, 3, 13, where God says, I, the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. So there you have a beautiful picture of the reversal of what you see here. God took them from the servitude, the dirty work of making bricks, crawling around in the mud. The other thing that Exodus 1.14 mentions is agriculture. And there are a couple uh, areas where we see agriculture at work. This picture is not the best, but uh, it's an old tomb, <laughs> 3,500 years old. Uh, but there you see, uh, here's a better version in another tomb, same thing. But here are workers, and they're stomping on grapes. They're, they're making wine out of grape juice. And here's another scene where they're doing the same thing. Uh, but look, look at these men. Another blonde-haired guy. Uh, here's an, clearly, there's a, a, a Sudanese Nubian or Kushite man. Here is probably a Canaanite by the kind of beard he has, the kind of hairline he has. These are all, I, this, these uh, details identify their ethnicity. So the point is here in agriculture, we also find them uh, uh, harvesting grapes, uh, pressing the wine press, pouring, and also in agriculture, um, here you can see uh, farmers pulling their, their plows with their oxen and so on. But um, Deuteronomy uh, has a very interesting note in which it's reminding us when we read this that where that when they lived in Egypt and worked with the agricultural side of things, that this was very different from the agriculture that will be conducted when they go to the land of Canaan. And the big difference, of course, in Egypt, you have the Nile, you have canals, you have irrigation. In the land of Canaan, everything is dependent on rain. So, and, and that's the point being made here. For the land that you are entering to take possession of is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where you sowed the seeds and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. But the land that you are going to over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water by the rain from heaven. So your agriculture is going to be different. It's going to be great. You just stand back and let it rain. Uh, that's how great uh, what I'm taking you from and taking you to is you don't have to dig and make canals and, and all of that. So uh, uh, there's a big shift in how their work life will be in farming. Uh, yeah, Psalm 81, uh, God reminds Israel, I relieved your shoulders of the burden and your hands were freed from the basket. Again, referring back to the sojourn in Exodus. Well, what's this business about? Okay, we saw taking the load off your shoulder, but what's this basket business? Well, uh, in Egypt, uh, even to this day, uh, soil is taken and in baskets and dumped into the fields as a kind of fertilizer. Um, this is especially done today when they're trying to reclaim desert lands for agriculture. Now, these little statues you see are found by the hundreds in the tombs of this period. Uh, these little statues you're looking at are about uh, maybe 10, 12 centimeters tall. And, uh, uh, take a, uh, a, and written on the text of these, um, and I, I want to call your attention to on the back of these little statues is a basket on the back and shoulders. In the front hands are miniature little hoe, little tools for digging, okay? The inscription that goes on these little statues 
uh, from these we learn that the Egyptian idea of heaven was not really what you and I would like it to be. Because their idea of heaven is when you die and you go before the judgment and you end up receiving eternal life, you get to work for the god Osiris and take care of his fields. So as on earth, so shall it be in heaven, rather than heaven shall it be in earth, it's the other way around. So now you're working for him in heaven, and that's why you go equipped with these bags, these baskets and tools, because your turn is going to come up, you're going to be called on to work. So we'll, uh, I just want to uh, move down to the yellow part of the print where it says um, that they will be making fields suitable for crops, of flooding the banks, and of carrying sand or soil from the east side to the west. And so the baskets are for carrying uh, soil or sand or whatever is needed for that particular archaeological or agricultural product. So um, again, another illustration of what the Bible is describing as the differences between agriculture in Egypt and the agriculture they will know in the land of Israel. Okay, so there are the tools again. Now, another thing I would expect. Now, how many of you people in this room are born and raised in Holland? So most are not. How many of you not born in Holland, when you return to your homeland, will have picked up some Dutch practices, maybe some little Dutch language? Maybe you like Dutch cheese now? and so on. This happens when you live in another culture. You begin to adapt and enjoy certain aspects of another culture, even while you retain the culture and language of your original home. Well, this happens with the Hebrews, and we can prove this. Um, I'm going to move on here. Yeah. Um, Probably the biggest thing that changes in the course of time with people who emigrate to another culture is after a couple generations, you start giving your kids names that fit the culture you're in. Many of our Chinese friends change their names in the States. So one of our good friends, his name is Jin, J-I-N, which is very easy to say, but he goes by Jim now. And so there is this practice of accommodating to the culture where you are. Well, the Israelites did this in a big way. We have many people in the biblical narratives and in the genealogical lists who leave at the Exodus with Egyptian names. And here's a list. And I wanted to point out all the names underlined in red have the same element, her, Hor, and that's the god Horus, you see right there. Horus is the sky god. And so, um, you know, like her as in Ben-Hur, you know, that, that guy, that movie. So Ben-Hur, Hur, that's, that's the name of this god. Hori is a way of, uh, uh, Har-Nefer is, Horus is beautiful. Nefer means beautiful. And you'd like the, god, the queen Nefertiti, same, same word, Nefer. Um, yeah, so what is, has been noticed for many, many years is among the Levites especially, which is odd, the priestly group, you have all these Egyptian names. Uh, the name of Moses is arguably, uh, there's a debate about Moses, Aaron. Miriam almost certainly is Egyptian. Phineas, I'll show you a Phineas a little bit later. But... So how do you account for all these people leaving the Exodus with Egyptian names if they hadn't been there? You know, uh, you know, in, in Africa, it might not be very likely that you're, you know, you'll be given the name Stanley or, you know, some American name, certainly not a Dutch name, if, you know. So how do you explain this if they're not there? And these are, so I say there's no evidence of Israel in Egypt, but there's a lot of evidence of Egypt in Israel's scripture. Okay? Now, one of the most intriguing 
uh, stories we have when the Israelites leave Egypt is in chapter 16, they've just got into the desert. They have this problem with food, and God says, all right, I'm going to provide manna. Six days you gather, the seventh day you rest. Now, again, bear in mind, these people did not have the book of Genesis, so they don't know Genesis 2. This is a big deal because in Egypt, you had a 10-day week. And there are three 10-day cycles or weeks, what we call week, in a 30-day month. And following the lunar calendar, you have 360 days in the year. Of course, that caused a little problem with the, with the solar year, but they had that figured out. So the introduction of Sabbath in chapter 16, right after leaving Egypt, is quite interesting because as if God is saying, okay, now you're back on my timetable. You're back doing things the way I ordained, and this is your first lesson and we get to Mount Sinai, get to Exodus 20, then you get further instructions about the Sabbath and so on. But it begins before they ever get to Mount Sinai and the law is given. And that's because they did not have a week in Egypt. I think it's remarkable if you think about it. We have all these nations represented here, which is so cool. Any of your countries have a 10-day week? Anybody, anybody not have a seven-day week? Eight days. Well, I'm not going to work there <laughs> unless you have a three-day weekend. <laughs> okay. Well, almost everybody in the world follows the seven-day week. Anyway. All right. So we already talked about that. When we think about the making of the golden calf might be an illustration of where something of Egypt snuck into their practice. In other words, uh, they're looking for a way to illustrate tangibly the invisible God. And, of course, the golden calf is made, or the young, the young bull. Uh, Egypt is full of various bovine deities. Cows, this is the goddess Hathor. Mother goddess, probably the most important bovine deity, but she's a, a, a cow. Uh, more likely, uh, one of these two bulls were uh, the model, if you will, for Aaron's golden image. Um, the apis bull uh, uh, on the bottom um, and above the bull of Heliopolis. Now, Heliopolis was just at the edge of the land of Goshen. In fact, you may remember that, according to the Bible, uh, Joseph's wife was the daughter of the priest of On, or Heliopolis. Um, so you wonder if some of those Egyptian beliefs started sneaking into the Hebrews' religious life as early as Joseph's generation. You know, we don't know for sure, but anyway. So we, we, we clearly have very important bovine deities in Egypt, and they may be behind the image. Here's Ramses the Great uh, uh, making an offering to the, um, the apis bull. So uh, very common. So not surprising to me if uh, this kind of imagery was what Aaron was familiar with and used. Now the tabernacle, a surprising amount of material in the tabernacle and the priestly attire are from, are actually Egyptian words. Uh, it, it's very, very intriguing. So for instance, we read again and again of linen that's used to cover the tabernacle. The priestly gown is made of linen. We'll see a little bit later that the sacred underwear worn by the priest was made of linen. And in every case, the Hebrew word that's used is the, is the word sheish. And it's the actually the Egyptian word for linen. Remember that nice white linen we saw the vizier wearing a few slides back. So what are we dealing with? We're dealing with something uniquely Egyptian. This word is not the common word in the rest of the Bible for linen. 
In fact, you see down below the word boots. Uh, we have that in Ezekiel, First Chronicles, Esther. It's the common Semitic word for linen. In the Joseph story, he's wearing a linen garment. Again, the Egyptian words used. So it's interesting that in the Egyptian settings, they're using the Egyptian linen. As time moves on, they don't have access to Egyptian linen in the land of Canaan, and the word just drops out of use. We can't get Egyptian linen anymore. The wood that's used to make the tabernacle and the furnishings um, is acacia wood, which is probably the only tree in the southern part of Canaan, Egypt, Sinai, that you could use to make things out of wood. Palm trees are pretty useless, at least the trunk, the branches you can do things with. But this was the only tree of any value as far as timber is concerned. Um, and you can you see them everywhere because they, they don't need a lot of water to thrive. But uh, the, the Egyptian word is uh, behind the Hebrew word shatim. So if you read in uh, that the Israelites were in shatim, just on the edge of Canaan, that's, that must have been the name of a place where there were a lot of, 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 of these uh, trees. So the Egyptian word shenech is behind the word shita, um, where we get the word for linen. And then there are a whole number of other little technical things, and, and my wife urges me not to get too bogged down in the details here, but show pretty pictures. So when we, when we think of the beautiful gold furniture found in King Tut's tomb just 100 years ago, the, the working of gold on wood was really mastered by the Egyptians. So the very fact that the Israelites our master artists at making the Ark of the Covenant and these various utensils and wooden poles covered with gold, uh, we can see, aha, uh -huh, they understood the technology. Somebody must have worked in that sort of work and took the knowledge with them. But what's more intriguing is that the Hebrew word that describes this process in Exodus 39, number 16, is the Hebrew word pachai, pachi. Uh, and it derives from the Egyptian word pecha. So it's the actual Egyptian word. So the technological word for this process of working gold is what we have in, in the, the, the Pentateuch or the Torah. So it's not just the way of doing it, but the very technology and the terminology came with it. Again, all these things are what I would call sugar lumps on our scale. Okay. Of course, the great throne of Tutankhamun. We have a beautiful jewelry in the tomb of Tutankhamun, and here you can see uh, one of the pectorals, which is almost the same size as the pectoral worn by the high priest. Uh, the three most common stones in Egyptian jewelry are turquoise, carnelian, which is the red, and lapis lazuli, which is the dark blue. Lapis lazuli comes all the way from, anybody know where? Afghanistan. Who said that? Oh, okay. The professor, of course. Well done, well done. Not everybody, not everybody knows that. And by the way, I confirmed that when I was getting my wife a, um, a, 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 a what do you call it, a, brooch or a chain for a piece of um, lapis. And this was in Cairo. And I said, to them, now where do you get this from? Afghanistan. So in antiquity, even in modern times, it comes from Afghanistan. Turquoise comes from central Sinai. And until later times, uh, by after 1200 BC, turqu turquoise is no longer mined in, Tina, in Sinai. And it drops out of use uh, in Canaan. You don't see it. You find it in Assyria uh, in later times, and it comes from Persia at that point in history. But um, yeah, so here's some turquoise from Sinai, or well, let's say it looks like turquoise from Sinai. Uh, the turquoise mines were basically exploited in ancient times, but it was Egypt's most favorite stone in jewelry. 
So it's interesting that the three most, and you see again, the red, the dark blue, and the turquoise colors. And this, those three are, are all stones that are on the high priest's breastplate. And the very fact that turquoise is not only found in Sinai, the Hebrew word nofake is derived from the Egyptian term also. So uh, once again, we find the influence of Egypt in the terminology. Um, here's one, by the way, that was found in, in Lebanon, in Byblos, uh, north of Beirut, uh, from before 1500. So you can show, here you can see both the technology and the use of these stones were found outside of Egypt. Uh, uh, so the idea that you find these things uh, for the Israelites is not really so far-fetched. Yeah, um, what we're looking at now is a piece of Tutankhamun's underwear made of linen. And uh, I wonder if indeed this is behind this, the sort of special underwear worn by the priests in Israel. You remember the priests were not, the altars were not to have steps on it because the priest was not to climb up and somehow show his, uh, what's underneath his garment. And then God ordains uh, the making of a linen underwear. And again, the word linen is the Egyptian word sheish. But the other interesting thing is that the Hebrew word meknese, and there's some dispute about the etymology, the origin of that word, but I've proposed that it comes from the Egyptian word kenes, which is the, the, the pubic area. And so this was particularly a, a, a piece of clothes to protect the priests uh, in doing their duty uh, as, as a priest climbing up on the altar and so on. And this was to, as we're reminded, uh, to cover up their uh, private parts. Yeah, well, we'll do a couple more and then we'll, we'll pull the plug. Um, there are a couple other pieces of the priestly garments that were worn and we can see them on, on clothes. Um, oops, sorry. Um, here are a group of priests. Notice these priests all have shaved heads. So some of you would qualify to be priests. Um, all you need is a beard, and a shaved head, no. Uh, the Egyptian priests were absolutely shaved from toe to head of the top as part of their idea of cleanliness and purity. Uh, so you can see them all there with their shaved heads. They wore a sash around the waist, and we're told that the Hebrew priests were to wear a sash around their waist. And the Hebrew word in Exodus and Leviticus is avnit, and uh, this derives from the Egyptian word bened, which means to wrap up. So uh, we're, we're adding more and more to the list of priestly attire, of which are Egyptian words. Um, then to the priest's turban, and there is a cloth band around it that um, Exodus 39, 29 talks about. Uh, and you can maybe just see here these priests, and by the way, these priests are wearing wigs. Uh, this strap that they are wearing here identifies them as a particular caste of priests, but they have these bands around their head, and you can see it tied and goes down the back. And uh, the Egyptian, the word for the priest's band on the uh, Hebrew high priest is pa'ar, and it derives from the Egyptian word pir, which means uh, a cloth band or a headband. So once again, we find all these little details just adding up and adding up. Uh, let me move on and talk briefly about Korah's rebellion. Uh, it's a great story in Numbers chapter 16. And you remember that Korah is challenging Moses as priest. Uh, why would Korah challenge Moses as being priest? Um, his name Korach means bald head or shaved head. That's the same derogatory term used of Elijah or Elisha. I'm sorry. Um, and but in Egypt, of course, the shaved heads were the priests. So it seems to me that Korach was probably a priest, Egyptian-styled priest, serving amongst the Hebrews. And if that's so, you can see how a lot of Egyptian priestly uh, 
practices were brought into ancient Israel and had to be weaned by God, and some of this stuff was acceptable, like God doesn't care if your linen hairband goes a certain way, ties in a certain knot. But that seems to be uh, behind um, Korah, who himself was a Levite um, and probably a priest, and now he's saying, well, who's this, this new guy that God is suddenly giving him all the, the status and all the authority? Uh, you know, I've been doing this for years, probably, we can imagine him saying. But in any event, here is a priest from the time of the Pharaoh Akhenaten, who I consider to be a monotheist, dates to 1340 B.C., and his name is Phineas, Panexi, uh, the same name as the uh, grandson of, of Aaron. Did I get that right? It's Eliezer Phineas, that's the order? Yeah. And so here's a, a, an Egyptian priest named Phineas, Panexi, and with his shaved head. Now, getting down to some interesting stuff. Any musicians here? Any brass players? The oldest known trumpets, I think, were found in the tomb of King Tut 100 years ago. And uh, there is uh, one is made of bronze, the other is made of silver mostly. Now, in Numbers 10.2, God says to Moses, now make two silver trumpets and let them be used for calling assemblies, for religious gatherings, and for military context, you know, da, 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 you know, just like the army of olden days would use the trumpets. So for many years, people looked at this passage and said, well, this is weird because we know the Hebrews use shofars, the, the ram's horn. What would they ever be doing and how would they know how to make silver trumpets? And boom, there, there we have two metal trumpets, including a silver trumpet from the tomb of, of King Tut. And how are they used in Egypt? Um, well, in the same way. You can see scenes where they're used, and the context is, is religious occasion, religious festival. Uh, the other would be uh, in military uh, to summon the troops to, to gather, to charge, etc. So um, the last category I want to deal with, and I'll try to wrap this up in, in a little over five minutes, um, is the area of geography. Now, we could spend the whole night talking about this, and um, some of you would be excited, some of you would be asleep. But scholars have tended to be dismissive in recent years of the geography in the book of Exodus as having any bearing on real space and time on maps from the time of Moses. Uh, and I cite a couple names there. Um, uh, one uh, scholar, William Johnson, a British scholar, says uh, regarding the geography, it is again futile, therefore, to attempt to locate this theological affirmation in geographical detail. In other words, look, it's all about theology. Uh, and so it's a waste of time and maybe even impossible to talk about real geography. But we are not dealing with a made-up world in the book of Exodus. We are not in Middle Earth. We are not in some Tolkien geographical sphere. It doesn't fit myth as they define it. Now, this is my professor, Donald Redford, with whom I have uh, had a long relationship. And interestingly, he uh, agrees with me, or I agree with him, that uh, regarding referring to the ge geography in the Bible as being sort of made up mythical stuff, he says, this is a curious resort for the text, does not look like mythology, at least on the definition of the latter as a timeless event set in the world of the gods. The biblical writer certainly thinks he is writing datable history. Now, where Redford and I depart is, he says, it's all in the 7th century. This reflects the period of Jeremiah coming to Egypt, that time period, not centuries earlier. So we agree in principle, we disagree in dating. Uh, 
I should, I'm going to skip these guys. And here I had a chance to visit my old professor a couple years ago. And uh, just to let you know, you can agree vehemently with, with somebody and still be friends and colleagues and respect them and learn from them. And so, by the way, I retired before he did. <laughs> I think he may be retired now. Um, so in Exodus 1, 11, we have two places named, Ramesses and Pitho. These are said to be the store cities the Israelites built. I won't get into the geography of the Exodus, that is, just for time, but I will focus quickly on these two and to tell you that Ramses has been absolutely found, no more dispute, although it took over a century to locate it. Um, the Bible refers to the place where the Israelites were building in Exodus chapter 1 as Ramses, and it's also called Ramses as the place where the Exodus began. They started out from Ramesses and they moved to Sukkot. That's in Exodus chapter 12, 36, 37. Well, we know that Ramses II, from hundreds of texts, built a capital in the delta of Egypt called uh, P. Ramses, which means P is for house or domain, house of Ramses, the domain of Ramses. In other words, he named the place after himself. Uh, kings in the past do that, right? There's Petersburg and different places named after the, the ruler. And most scholars agree that P. Ramesses of Egyptian text is Ramesses of the biblical text. And by the way, the word Ramesses, and this is important, only occurs in the Pentateuch or Torah. Only there. Okay? That'll be important in a moment. Now, for decades, thanks to the excavations of Indiana Jones and his professors, his pre predecessors at Tanis, it was thought that that was Ramses. So when Indiana Jones was there, that's what they thought. Because the French thought it, the French who were digging. Okay. So, however, uh, Zoan and Tanis is another city mentioned in the Bible. Again, Zoan, depend on your translation. Tanis is simply the Greek vocalization of the Hebrew Tzoan. So it depends on what translation you're looking at. You could see either of these names. Zoan and Tanis occurs in Isaiah, Ezekiel, and in the Psalms. Never in the Torah is that place mentioned. Now, this is very interesting because we know why. The city of Tanis was not established till around 1100 or a little after 1100. And the city of Ramses ceased to exist just before 1200. Did you follow that? Okay, I'll repeat that again. Zoantanus only occurs outside of the Pentateuch. Ramses only occurs in the Pentateuch. Um, let me come back to this. Here's Tanis in the northeastern delta. Google Earth image. It's a huge site. And uh, you go there today, it's been cleaned up a little bit more. There used to be blocks everywhere and statues everywhere. They've cleaned it up and organized it now, but all the blocks on the surface have the name of Ramses the Great, statues of his, and so on. The French were digging here for years, and they were convinced they'd found the, the capital city of Ramses. But when they excavated down into the ground, they realized that the pottery they were discovering was from a much later period. It didn't correspond with the dates of the texts. So they knew that there was a problem of a couple hundred years. There's one of the great statues of Ramses lying on the ground, one of the obelisks, which now has been taken to the new museum, which we're waiting to open. It's no longer laying there. So what we now know is that this, er this site called in Arabic Kantir, the ancient Pyramuses, was built uh, about 20 kilometers uh, south of Tanis. Um, now, if you go to, to Ramses today, there's very little to see. Even the, the feet of the statue, and that's my daughter, over 20 years ago, um, 
that statue, uh, the feet have been taken. Part of the statue was broken, and uh, some things have been found here, but most of the city is gone. Here's the arm of the statue. Here are some other things that have been found. What we now understand was the great city of Ramses, and you'll get a better idea of it in a moment, was connected to a very important branch of the Nile. And in the course of about 150 years, that Nile branch began to desiccate, dry out. Uh, I don't know what your main highway system is here, but if you could imagine the main highways to Amsterdam all, were all gone. Amsterdam probably would no longer be the capital. You'd choose another city where the highways could still connect, where the ports could still connect. That's what happened in Egypt. So the city was abandoned. But the Egyptians were great recyclers. So they took almost all the blocks, all the statues, all the great obelisks, brought them to Tanis to make their new capital. And so uh, to study the fields of Goshen, the land of Goshen today, is largely being done by German archaeologists. And for years, they spent doing a magnetometer survey. The magnetometer uh, does subsurface uh, readings and produces a map. Oh, sorry. The, the part that they did, unfortunately, you have a present-day town here. So we know the city was more than a kilometer by a kilometer in the main downtown area. It's huge. Uh, yeah, and here is uh, Professor Edgar Pusch, who I, I learned sadly just passed away in January. He directed the work for 25 years, and he handed it over to his young colleague, uh, Hennig Franzmeier, who is a friend of mine. And I was delighted to find out that um, uh, he's continuing Professor Pusch's work. I'm going to move on. I wanted to show you this. This is something the magnetometer popped up. Okay. Uh, what intrigued me about this was it looked like it could be a palace, it could be a, a temple, but right here are storage facilities. These are made of mud brick, and they're all the same. They're typically long, narrow. I'll show you pictures of them in a moment. But every temple, every palace in ancient Egypt had these storage facilities. And what are the Israelites doing? They're making are mas kanot, or store cities, or cities of storage. I think these were huge storage facilities associated with temple complexes, palace complexes, and so on. So uh, 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 Dr. Franz Meyer and his lecture at this Congress I just attended last week in, in uh, Leiden uh, has started excavating this area, and he knows, no, it's a palace. So thoroughly was this city uh, recycled, if you will, that the lines you see, these white lines, these are all, this is all sand. The stone has all been taken out. So all you have is the sand that the foundation of the stone was laid on. The stone is gone. It was taken and reused. So he can actually excavate, know the plan of this temple, and so on. Now, to give you a sense, this is the funerary temple of Ramses the Great, um, called the Ramesseum. And you can see the temple right here. And surrounding it are all these storage facilities. You see them? These are vaulted, um, which is pretty amazing, um, having these vaults 12, 3,200 years old. And these were the storage facilities. I think this is what the Israelites were making bricks for, to build buildings like this to store things for the city, at the palace, at the temple, and so on. Uh, Professor Push uh, also discovered the, the stable of the city. And I'll just wrap up with that because uh, he has estimated, and, and here's a reconstruction, that this stable could house 360 horses. So when we think of Pharaoh sending his chariots out after the Hebrews, uh, right there at his command, he had uh, 
Well, if you cut that in half, 180 chariots, and of course there were other forts in the vicinity where he could call, uh, summon up chariots to pursue the Hebrews. Okay, now I'm going to skip this and come to the conclusion. I am sorry to be out of time. Sorry, I'm going to do. There we go. I mentioned at the beginning the idea of preponderance of evidence. That is taking little bits of evidence, adding them, adding them, adding them. And I gave you probably seven, eight different Egyptian words used in association with the tabernacle, priestly attire. These make no sense coming into the Egyptian language in the Persian period. It just doesn't. Now, I want to explain preponderance of evidence because I'm using this in, in my, my second edition of my book, Israel and Egypt, which is now in press. Um, according to Cornell University Law School, the preponderance of evidence is one type of evidentiary standard used in a burden of proof analysis. Under the preponderance standard, the burden of proof is met when the party with the burden convinces the fact finder that there is a greater than 50% chance that the claim is true. In our court system in America, and these, we're talking about civil cases, not criminal cases, but in civil cases, if you can make the audience or the, the jury think that you're 51% right, that's considered enough to meet the test of the preponderance of evidence. So uh, I'm basically trying to argue in my book, when you add all this material, and I've only given you a little sampling tonight, that this surely meets the burden of proof. But the modern day believer, we started with this question, uh, can confess along with Paul and the saints of old that these things happened. Can't prove it, but the preponderance of evidence strongly suggests it. Thank you.